we have something that's really kind of an interesting piece of content right now. When I first came to Malma uh, a year or so ago, it might have been, uh, starting to work with the folks here, they said, you know, Hampus Jacobson, Hampus Jacobson, as we say in the U.S., Jacobson is an amazing tech entrepreneur who, uh, and if you look online, there's a great YouTube video of why he chose to sell to the company that he did, uh, as opposed to uh, Google and Apple and all those kinds of things. They told him he could be creative. And Hampus is a brilliant, creative person, and now he's able uh, to be an angel investor. But we had a discussion of how do I think about my money, and how do I think about the cost of the impact and how do I think as a traditional investor? And so I thought a lot of people are wanting to figure out that same journey. How do I think about this impact investing with impact? And yet, how do I think about it compared to how I used to think about investing? So I realized what we wanted to do is, is have Hampus walk through his evolving decision set uh, with some people who could really guide him well. So we're adding, Hampus will be up here with two extremely experienced impact investors who will just walk through how Hampus is thinking about investments in this space compared to investments in technology. So Hampus, if you would come up along with Oliver Karius and Nikki Armacost, I think we'll have a really great session here. Thank you, thank you. Sir. This is off mute, yep. I don't know whether we're going to be guiding you or whether you're going to be guiding us. Or if I'm that creative and brilliant, but let's <laughs> see what happens. Well, you're definitely creative and brilliant, oh. um, and so is Oliver. Um, but why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, your businesses for the people who, who don't know? Yeah, so this whole thing started. I, I started a company in Sweden in 2002, uh, which is called TAT, and we did and do user interface design and user interface technology. And when doing that, you very quickly become... a more or less a strategy consultant for uh, a lot of your customers. So we started f thinking a lot about innovation and all of those things. And um, in that process, we create a lot of new ideas inside the company. And I had to create a model of which ideas we should promote and which ideas we should kill as quickly as possible um, and a way to do that. And when I started to build that model, I found that the problem in a company of 180 people is that you've got a shortage of entrepreneurs that can walk through fire and hell, frankly, which all entrepreneurs have to do. Um, so I figured the only way I can test this model is to go outside the building and try to find other people and test the model on. And when I started doing that, uh, we found, and I, oh sorry, I found ideas that I felt, this was a great idea and you really have everything. If you only had like 15K dollars, that would, you would be able to, well, I do have 15K dollars, so, but I don't wanna, no. And after a while I just figured, yeah, here's the 15k dollars, and I mean, go try this, uh, and and then sort of I, I, I that's how I sort of stumble into investing, um, and uh, that was 2007, and now I've done I've done uh, 15 investments, and of them three, three and a half, depending on how you would count, are I would say impact investments, and it's um, I'm I'm good. I know what I'm good at. I'm good at consumer IT, and I'm good at uh, understanding people and communication, uh, and that that definitely limits me in what companies I can invest in and how I can do due diligence and everything. So a lot of times I'm completely fumbling in darkness when l s listening to an amazing idea of an amazing smart uh, smart idea that we just did. For me, I'm not a, a I'm not a woman. <laughs> B, will this work? Will, as we discussed earlier, with the last mile, can we supply these to the right people? Can they buy it and everything? I can design the homepage. <laughs> so, so, so Hampus, I mean, this is when we spoke. It, this must be Christmas for you because you have all these incredible ideas out there. I, if you look at your history, where you've come from, you've been a really, really successful entrepreneur, right? Um, and as Kevin said, you're wanting to transition to become more like an impact investor. Could you share with us, you know, what, what does impact for you mean? Because in the past, it seems that you've been extremely good at identifying young startups. What do you look for in those? And what drives you to now sort of s come here, uh, be inspired by these wonderful business opportunities? So what is impact for you? What kind of impact would you like to achieve for yourself? They you say, yes, this is really good. Um, oh, good question. I think the one, th one of the issues there, I haven't at all defined impact. I mean, for me, I, I, I have like four criteria when I invest in a company. It's like, 
um, can I be proud of what they do? Uh, and, and pride there, that can be something very local, of course. It can be very sort of low impact on a global scale or, uh, or not. And that it, it could be something that is not impact investment in the good kind. They just impact the world. And it's, it's a great thing, but it might not be societal impact. Um, the, se the second thing is I want to have fun. The people I meet, I want to be able to want to meet them again and again and again and again. Because otherwise, I, I will never, I, I can't invest them. And then the third criteria is I want to learn things because that's why I'm here on the planet. So investing in things that are things I already know too much about, like mobile phone user interfaces, I don't want to do that, because I, 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 I can learn a lot of things there, but I'm not interested actually in learning a lot more in that field. Um, and then the fourth is adding value, uh, because the people I want to meet, I feel that I don't want to be, I just don't want to write a check and say, okay, hope that you do something good with that. And the problem of these four criteria is some of them are, are completely, some of them are orthogonal and everything's nice, but some of them are actually opposite, like adding value and learning. It's like the more I know about a field, the more I can add value, but the more I know about a field, the less I'm going to learn. Um, so those are like my four criteria, and due diligence of these are very <laughs> soft, of course. W w <laughs> <laughs> well, due diligence, I think we should talk about due diligence at some point because I think it's, a, it's an interesting point uh, depending on the stage of the company that you're investing in. But one of the other things you told us earlier was that you, when you're evaluating a company, you look for, for three things to see whether you think that model is going to work and have impact. And we actually tested it. We happened to be standing next to the, the Ruby Cup and we kind of tested it ourselves on the Ruby Cup to see whether it would pass the Hampus test. And, and, and it, uh, well, I won't give away whether it did or it didn't. You can give away, but, but don't why still. don't you share that with everyone? So now it sounds like I'm going to tell lists of everything here. So here's another list. I'm sorry. No, but, but, but it's a good point. I think that th th this, is when we, this is sort of what we did at TAT when evaluating ideas, generally. Any ideas. Not impact ideas at all, but ideas. Is it technically feasible? Can you build it? Can you scale it? Will it work? What happens when you have a billion users? Uh, in Rubicup's case, I mean, anything from manufacturing to the last mile of supply chain. Uh, sort of just the, the, the technical part. And that's been a science since Archimedes. So, I mean, due diligence of that is like, bring in a good engineer and that person will tell you if it works or not, pretty much. Um, the second part being consumer experience. So the consumer, the user of the product, not necessarily the buyer of the product, but the consumer of the product, will that product like it? In Rubicup example, I can't test it, which is hard for me because I hate it, because I want to be a user myself. But do you have a wife? Yes, I do. Exactly. And do you have a mother? And do you have a absolutely, sister? Absolutely. And do you have my an mother's auntie? Unfortunate. For Rubicup, my mother's unfortunately too old. And, and, and for my wife, <laughs> she's breastfeeding. But you can ask her whether she... <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I can, but I, I'll have to find other women. And uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> what have we opened yeah. here? It's going to be very interesting. Interesting start dialogue. Are like, are you menstruating? It's like, yes. Okay, good. Then <laughs> I want to talk to. Uh, and then the third criteria for me is uh, market fit, and that's like, it's the whole complexity around uh, the supply chain, and and I mean, and really the market, like. Is your suppliers going to be your competitors? Because in some cases, especially, I mean, I did businesses in building mobile phones. And when you build mobile phones, the problem is your customer is a handset manufacturer, and you have to understand why they sell phones. And today, the market's even worse. Like Google and Amazon, they're doing a subsidy business. They don't really care about phones at all. They're building platforms. So if you sell to them, you really have to understand how they work. And a lot of companies really don't understand this. They, they think their customer is their consumer, I mean their user. And that's, of course, not at all the case. So these are the three things sort of I, I do diligence, sort of. These are the three, three things I ask them about. Like, I want to talk to users, or I want to see users having it, or I want to feel the use myself, and, and ask the questions about what, what happens when you get a billion users? Or wh what happens when, when you have to produce? OK, you're producing five now. What if you would have to produce 50,000? And oh, we haven't really thought about that. Like, mm. Or actually, often even worse, on the other scale, people tell you, we can do this really in a good margin if we produce 2 million units a month. It's like, how do you do it for 5,000 units? Oh, you can't. Hard you to see, that, that, that's, that's really exciting to have, to be sitting here with you as a really successful entrepreneur, where you already have those kind of three uh, selection criteria to identify new, new businesses. Now, coming back to the impact question, couldn't we just add a fourth question for mm. you? So when you look at deals, actually have that fourth criteria to assess impact? 
It is a very good... Yeah, it really could be, good. will it change the world in some way, a big way or a small way? What impact yeah. will it have? And, and on a personal level, I mean, do you see yourself as you migrate into this impact investment space, you yourself, that you want to create that impact? Or would you like to be part of, of a group of other entrepreneurs who come together to share that deal flow, to really drive, to bring you know, the different experiences that you might have together to the fore to help these entrepreneurs grow? I think it's... Because that's a, sorry, that's a that's a key issue that we see in terms of aggregating the kind of capital at the different stages that these entrepreneurs need to really grow. Is what we were discussing as well. Who comes in at the early stage and the next stage, and to really ramp that up. So, how do you, would you be interested to be part of that group, or are you currently on your own, scoping it out, dipping a water, a uh, toe in the water to get a feel? I think that for me, I think that autonomy, for me, autonomy is is one of the criteria for being happy. So I, one of the things I hate about people creating consortias is that that slows me down. It's like whenever my name is added to a list, that means I get a responsibility of being part of that group. And I have to think, what am I saying in this forum? Because that might hurt the group and stuff like that. Uh, I'm a fourth child. If you're a fourth child, you're sort of told, be an individual and care about your brothers because <laughs> then your stuff is just going to screw up. So I think for me, being an, uh, an individual is really important for me. But um, at the same time, a lot of the investments I do, I do with someone else because they have the field competence. Uh, when you invest in a company, uh, I know what I'm good at and I know what I'm not good at. Well, I, there are a lot of things I don't know, of course. But sometimes you need to, to, to if, if, if you... If you um, if you co-invest, the other party should be the, the complementing party. So, for example, I recently did an investment in a company that what they what the they have all their business set, everything works, but what they need most is somebody that can tell them to focus. And I can tell them to focus, but the guy who I co-invest in, in is one of those super McKinsey guys uh, um, who he's been telling big companies to focus uh, for the 30 year, th five years of his life, uh, even though he's just 35. And that feels perfect for me because he's, he, can, he can give business reasons why to focus. I can just give those soft reasons why to focus. So he's a perfect complement uh, in, in that case. So, so if you're if you're uh, you like to go solo, you're saying at least for now, and maybe we can get Oliver to change your mind yeah. because you know I think we should get into what Oliver does because I think yeah. that's also very because there's also comfort in going in with other people. Yeah. Um, but but I also do go solo, so to speak. Um, and so, at what stage do you go in? Wh when do you like to be there? You talked about saying you know all they need is fifteen thousand, which is which is very early on. That's after friends and family won't talk to you anymore, but when people like Oliver won't give you any money yet because you don't have a track record. Are you comfortable in that space? Yeah. H and how do you evaluate an investment in that kind of a context? Yeah, I think we talked about that. I think we are in a, in a sort of a similar early stage. Uh, you have 10 people. I have, I have me and my, my wife that says no. No, I'm kidding. No, but I'm I, I myself. So um, I think that the earlier stage, the better on the criteria is that I can add value and learn. My, my, one of my fears of being part of a consortia is that I'm gonna be, there's going to be a proxy between me and the company. So when I talk to the company, uh, they're gonna, as a company, you don't want investors asking a lot of questions. So you like set up the list of KPIs and send out the email. So if you have a proxy, after a while you ask questions, they say, oh, can't you bring up this at the, at the investor meeting every quarter? Like, yeah, but the opportunity for me to learn is, is nil because they're going to be, I mean, get once a quarter, that's too slow of a, of a frequency of feedback for me. So um, so if you can offer that, then you should tell what you do, Oliver, exactly, because I think it's... Tell us, <laughs> Oliver, give come us on. Pitch. So um, <coughs> we at, as, as we heard, we come in when in entrepreneurs have a, a proven model, um, they come out of the kind of startup phase, they can demonstrate that they have a good team on, on, uh, on the ground. They're creating impact. And there's this kind of early expansion stage. So we provide 200,000 up to a million. It can be sort of tranched. We do grants, debt, and equity, depending on the underlying business model. And we do actually try to get really involved with our entrepreneurs. Um, and in not just providing and writing sort of dumb checks, if you will, and coming back in December, um, but really a actively engaging with the entrepreneurs, working through the strategy, the business model, and how they scale up. So, uh, and we are very interested to understand sort of the, the early, the pipeline, where do the deals come from, how can we work together there, and in, in working with partners on finding the different types of capital that comes in so that we're creating sort of a, a relay race, if you will, that the entrepreneur can just focus really on executing, creating impact, and the investors really just slot in and help grow the entrepreneur 
um, and not be uh, not be a nuisance because otherwise that would prevent us from achieving impact. Yeah, because I think one two things you did, which I think were, were, were the reason why I would be more interested in, in working more with you. And one is the thing that you actually have, which sounds ridiculous that it would be something unique, but that you have teams on the ground. You have you you're you're doing global impact investment, and you have people in the countries. It's not as if you're saying, oh, let's 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 have rabbits in Australia. That sounds like a great idea. That's not going to destroy the ecosystem at all. No, yeah, I mean, you have people there that that, that sort of that kind of value and, and and pool ideas. Absolutely, and we found that that works really well because, like any venture capitalist, um, I don't want to find out in December that the CFO fell off a horse in February, because then we can't help. Um, but I would love to find out in March so that we can come together, work with other investors, sit around the table and sort of say, okay, what can we bring both in capital? Can we bring in experts? Can we bring in uh, other <coughs> network partners, what the organizations need right now? And I mean, all the business p business plans that we've looked at over the last four years, we've looked around 3,000 deals, some of them, you know, just desk base, you can sort them out pretty quickly and others you can go a bit more in into depth. All the numbers that you find in there, you know, halve them, and and then you're getting close to what somehow looks realistic. But it's this interaction and it's as much us learning, mm. right? And working with the entrepreneur. So it's I think it fundamentally comes down it's a people's business and it comes down to trust. Absolutely, yeah. Right? So it's the entrepreneur feeling very comfortable saying this is the kind of investor that I want to work with. So we've set up teams in Latin America, Africa, India and Southeast Asia and China to who really work on the deals on a day to day basis. They come out of the country, they speak the language, they have the culture, they understand the context, um, <coughs> and work with the entrepreneurs on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that for me, that is a, a strong compliment. There is that you you can part part of the question. They're both market fit and consumer experience. You have people that can at least tell from the cult just the cultural aspect uh, of these two. I mean, maybe not the mechanics, knowing that it's actually going to work, but you can just say. That's never going to work in in country X Y Z. I mean, we did we did a, mm. TAT worked a lot in South Korea, and doing business in South Korea and doing business in North America are very different. So for me, if somebody would tell, oh, we're going to do this in South Korea, I would say, no, don't. I mean, they won't even talk to you about that because they think it's a ridiculous idea. Whereas in North America, they're going to love it. Uh, I think the, the what you just mentioned, the, the kind of cultural aspect, is so critical. I mean, a lot of times when we look at deals, the actual technology. Um, yes, there, there are a lot of critical elements to making a technology work, but that doesn't mean that the deal will be actually be successful. So it's around distribution, mm -hmm. it's around the, the pricing, as you said, the cultural, the, the cultural fit, and, and that is absolutely critical. And there, you know, we, we're learning on every deal. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's never a straightforward thing, but it's very much sort of submerging and talking to networks. So I think this, why, this is where SOCAP is so great, that you can bring all the different capital providers around the table, the entrepreneurs to, together, to build this network that we actually can, can work together more closely. Are you cross-pollinating your deals? Are you asking entrepreneurs in company A to talk to company B? Because that's the, I, I I do it, I do that and I love it because it's you have somebody solving problem A so why should everybody solve it? But we we try to do that in sort of the south south exchange in the on uh, in our portfolio peer coaching. Yeah, not not explicitly peer coaching, but saying look if you have a distribution platform and you're looking for like water filters or lamps or whatever it might be, you might be talk you might want to talk to X Y and Z. But a lot of times the entrepreneurs already know each other mm -hmm. fairly well. Oh, interesting. So they they do exchange, but of course they are so. Uh, focused on on growing their company and creating impact, that um, you know, having them then talk to others um, really takes them out of their day to day business. So that needs to be be done very well. But I think that you should host like a Christmas party for your or whatever Hanukkah party, and depending on, and you have to find out a common non-religion or religions so that people can come um, um, once a year, where you bring like the founders or CEOs and founders and CEOs of your companies together just for like a two day like uh, outing so that because what's going to happen there is somebody's going to say well, you're doing that with that well, interesting because we have exactly that problem with this i think it's certainly something that we want to do i think thank god there are things like skull where everybody comes together or socap where we're in a short amount of time you can bring together of course it's not that structured mm. and i agree like mulago does that they're flying their entrepreneurs for a, an okay. offsite camp where they can exchange and they bring in experts i think that intervention is is, is very very good it's also i must say a, a financing question of if course. i ask our principal um to fly everybody in um, but i think it's it's a, an excellent idea and i think it's something for us uh, as we sit on more on the investor side to think through what added value can we bring to you, to your entrepreneur uh, and, and to other investors to not just writing a check. That's, you know, th that, that's very easy to do to write a check, but it's really adding the, the, adding the value.
Yes, I, as I think we talked about, I think it's interesting also that we do similar size of investments. You do slight, slightly or definitely larger than I do uh, commonly. And I think that you have, I guess you have a due diligence mechanism. I mean, you, you have lawyers and what have you to check out things. Yes, we do. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> we, I guess we we work more. Could you tell a bit about how you do investments? Yeah, we were we were we were talking earlier on, and the the size the size that we do is is around fifty thousand. As I said earlier, it's you know after the entrepreneur has really lost all goodwill from anyone who cares about the person. No one will talk to the person again. They still need money. The other. Um, the other investors won't invest because they don't have a prototype, they don't have a track record, they don't have another investor who's gone in with them, uh, the, the amount is too small, they, they don't want to do less than 200,000 or 500,000 or whatever it is. Um, and so we give, we give that very early stage, you know, 50 to $75,000 to help jumpstart, to catalyze that, that business. And we were, our company's called Arc Finance, and, and one of our investees called us Arc Angels. And he said, you're, you're Arc Angels because you go where angels fear to tread. And, and then someone else said, well, you know, what do you call that kind of capital? Is that patient capital? And someone else chipped in and said, no, that's reckless capital. Um, because because what do you, when you have a business that's that small, you don't have a track record, how do you do due diligence? And so the way that we do it, it's a kind of a... It's a sniff test. It feels, it doesn't sound terribly scientific. There aren't a lot of numbers that you can run, but it's not entirely irrational. What you're doing is you're evaluating an idea. It has to be a really good, interesting idea. And we, we have a very narrow space that we're interested in. We're interested in financing mechanisms for clean energy, water, and sanitation. So it, that's pretty narrow. And the, yes. the concept has to be, so it's specialized. It's like, it's like, you know, we were saying earlier, it's almost like boutique investing, it is. like a boutique hotel, you know? And, um, and, and we, we, get to know, we get to know our investees. Um, we have Ajaita here, we have um, Simpa Networks. You know, there are a bunch of different players where we've, we either have had a relationship with them, we've watched them over time, they've been recommended by someone else, or they have a concept that fits into that sweet spot that we're interested in. So, so, it sound, so it's not exactly reckless capital at the end of the day. It does have some rationale in there, but it's reckless in the sense that a more traditional investor wouldn't want to tread in that space. You can understand that you're originally Italian and you're German. I mean, there's, a, there, there's, there's, there's some reckless as an organization <laughs> uh, elements. To but, well, we talked <laughs> One of the other things that we were saying is about your passion. So, what's your passion? And um, the protest on that one. <la> he's, he does. Ha he's actually South African, so he's very passionate underneath yes, well, there hello. somewhere. <laughs> um, but you know, I think I think that's actually an interesting point. And you were you were you were talking about your areas of passion. For me, it's definitely about about clean energy, about um, clean water, it's about basic human needs, it's about social justice issues in terms of those kinds of things. That's what I care about, that's what makes me excited at the end of the day. And if people are able to pay for that, then we're gonna solve a very big problem, which is that two billion people don't have access to clean energy. That's, that's, what, that, that's what gets me excited and makes me feel thrilled about what I do on a daily basis. But, uh, but if I yeah. listen to Hampus, I mean, you, you seem to have all those wonderful ingredients already. You have the knowledge how to evaluate businesses. You're, you're really passionate. I am very passionate. Really? Though, yes, yes. You're so passionate. So you want to create impact. Mm -hmm. um, what keeps you up at night as you transition away from becoming twins? Twins. twins. Yeah, exactly. I have kids. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they keep me up at night. Apart from those, yes. Yes. Sorry. Apart from, apart from the twins, if you uh, sort of transition now to come more, become more active in the space. What is it that you need? I think one. I think. I think. I think definitely two things. One is actually the focus that you talked about. That I think one of my problems is that the company I meet, the second company is not s at all similar to the first. Which is, I, I I don't have I don't have an idea what they're talking about. It. I have to spend months of learning usually, and and I'm not a person who can spend months on focusing on anything. So, I think that the problem is that either I do reckless investing or I don't. And so I think that. Uh, Leading on to that, actually, either focus or like 
partners or, or, or uh, field knowledge, application knowledge. So for me, I mean, one of the things which which I, I like doing is that I, 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 I'm sort of an, uh, I like networks and building networks of people. And one of the things I always do when I talk to somebody and, and evaluating their ideas, of course, picking up the phone and calling someone else and sort of, okay, I'm talking to these guys, do you know what they're doing? And like, A, evaluate the person and B, evaluate the idea. And usually you know somebody who's done something in this field used to be for me. But suddenly when you meet a company that's going to educate uh, uh, pregnant women in China, I feel like I only know people who sell hardware in China. I know how to source silicon in, in, in China in large volumes. Mothers in China. I never thought about that. I mean, and, and, and I don't have anybody to call. So, uh, so it's it's basically the next phase is sort of to go through your areas of, of, of that you feel passionate about and then sort of finding your way with partners on, on to sort of honing in on, on doing deals. How many deals do you want to do and, and how much would you like to do? I mean, how much can you do with twins? Yeah, exactly. With twins, the thing is, I have I have actually a grant. I have forty eight hours uh, uh, per day, so I have uh, <laughs> yeah. I have a, a couple more hours squeezed in actually. Um, no, but but I think that how many I, I want to do, I don't know. I have no clue. I think that uh, I do things to learn, mm -hmm. and and investing for me has been to learn, and not only in the field, but learning how to invest. So I think if I one day feel that I'm not learning anything then I'm not going to do, do it anymore. I, if I feel that, I mean, either that I become extremely successful and I feel I can't learn anything, never going to happen, or B, feel that I actually just fail and I don't learn from my failures, then I should probably quit too. So I think that's probably my, my, my philosophy right now. Dabbling is what I do. Well, and I think it's great that you dabble because we need more dabblers. And I want to come back to the point that you raised earlier, which is that it, it gives you the willies if you don't know about the sector. So, for example, the Ruby Cup yeah. is a really, really interesting concept. You know, you're, you, as you say, you're not a woman. Yeah. Uh, but, but there are plenty of ways you can evaluate whether that's a good investment, which are, which are completely rational and which don't involve having to have experienced the use of it yourself. No, I think with Rubicup, I would say, I think that the, the, the consumer experience part of Rubicup, I think I could evaluate that in 24 hours. I mean, I would say, give me one of those cups and I'll call you back in 24 hours. And I, because that's, that I can do with my normal network because 49% of the plant's population are women and I know at least some of them. But the problem is actually the, the, <laughs> the market fit. I mean, the like uh, supply chain and, and, and sort of the whole like, Getting the cups from A to B and like uh, I mean the Tupperware logic. I, I mean that's so far away from whatever I've done. I mean I hate the idea. I hate the idea of having. I see products as dairy. If you have them for a week, they're old and stale and they're useless because that's where I come from. I come from a design business, so it, you I couldn't bring up an idea in front of a, a customer or client that was two weeks old because they looked. Oh, this looks kind of like an orange concept. Yes, we did some work for Orange. Like, ah, oh, we can't have something that looks like Orange. Okay, uh, does that look like Vodafone's? Yes, it does. Like, okay, so you need something which is completely new. So for me, physical products is like conceptually the worst idea ever because you need store them in places and 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 move them between places and stuff. I'm a, I'm a digital person. I mean, I I'm a seriously. I mean, that's something where I need somebody to say that's not going to be a problem. I mean, cups selling. Those in Africa, plastics, heat. I just feel, are they going to last? Is it going to work? Sorry? <laughs> silicon, silicon and heat. I mean, this is thing. I don't know even the materials. I mean, and, and I mean, for me, but, I was like, but like so, so I, you, were, you were interested and excited about that idea. Very. There was something that was it, was, it was, it was seducing you. It was enticing you. So what would it take to have you, you know, fall all the way over in love with it? I think that for me to overcome your resistance. No, I think that uh, I think that I'm an engineer originally, actually, an engineer that that sort of spent all my life in design and, and business. And I think that for me, I have I'm I'm good at falling in love with with things. And I think that what I fall in love with is an entrepreneur. I hear the idea and I feel, oh, I want to help this person. I love the idea. I really want to help this person. But then the German engineer, the Swedish, sorry, engineer part of me, <laughs> have to think, can this actually be done? Right. And I think that is the part that has to be sort of told that it works. So, so how would you mitigate your risks in that context? Would it be by giving a small amount to no, see what's I mean, done, or would it be some other way that you would mitigate your risks? I, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that I like... I like uh, when the rubber hits the road, that's the best part, of course. And I think that I hate when investors say, yeah, come back when you've 
field bubble is like, yes, of course. And I mean, anybody can, then anybody can invest. Why would you ever talk to, I mean, then you talk to Sequoia and Index. I mean, somebody that actually can help you. With your, why would you talk to a mid-sized fund? Uh, I want to challenge you on, you on that and, and, and what we discussed earlier with due diligence. I think due diligence always gets bashed. Uh, it's not a bad thing, due diligence. No, no, it's a, no, no, no it's I sort like of, it. It's, you need to understand it in order to make the right decision, to provide the right kind of funding, to provide, provide ki the kind of value. So we always see due diligence more like a consulting process. Yes. No, I would it's like dating, right? No, it is. Yeah, you sort of see, is it compatible? Are we going the same way? Do we have the same mission? Do we want, you know, all of that. And then you say, yes or no. I mean, you can also walk away from a deal. Yeah. But at least what we found is that working with... Or you can live together for a while and just, you know... Cohabitate. Cohabitate. Yeah, and, that's, you know, that's and all no, possible. But I mean, I would definitely Not get married. I would definitely say investing... I, I, I mean, I don't know how many entrepreneurs I've told when they've found, oh, I found an investor, an angel investor, and one invest. I, I, we're, we're doing the deal tomorrow. I, I, I don't know how many times I've said, investment is like dating. Would you ever marry a person that you met last night? Like, no, it's not. He's giving me this amount of money. Yeah, but you're going to... You're going to have to live with this person for a long time. I mean, so I would definitely... But I think what you said about due diligence being useful, I think one of the things I've learned is one of the companies that I've invested in, I spend... Now they're raising a round, and uh, when they're writing their business plan to show this normal investor that needs all the KPIs and everything and the Excel sheets done, what I found out during this process is that the company does not actually really know how their business works. Uh, because when you write that plan, you figure out... What, are you telling me that, okay... So together we've built this model, uh, uh, like Excel sheet model, of course, like users come in, they do this, what's the traction, how, what's the lifetime value and everything. And doing that, the entrepreneur has said like a thousand times, oh, why didn't we do this from the start? And, and my honest answer would be, oh, I should have done my due diligence because then we would have done it and I would have still invested, but I would have, we would have done this together and we would have one year of a good company structure instead of like shooting, a lot of companies like shoot in, in Swedish, of course, then sw shoot moose in the dark. Like they fire their gun and then they eat moose in the evening. Did they hit the moose or did the moose die of fear? You, they don't know. They don't know. I mean, they eat. They they eat. They're happy. It's like no, but you, then you can't systematize it. Then if you can't hire a hundred hu hunters, so I think that is a big problem for a lot of of entrepreneurs. They are happy in small scale, but can you scale it? Because do you know how the machine works? So I, I would say due diligence is great. And that's one of my issues that going into sectors I know, sure, I can look at the machine, I can open it up and sort of look at the cables, metaphorically. But last silicon, sorry, in, in, in warm parts of Africa, I just like, does this work? And of course, I mean, I could just call a, a, an engineer working in plastics and say, yeah, if it's not like 250 degrees Celsius in Africa, that's not going to be an issue. It's like, oh, okay, so silicon is not that difficult then. But I mean, I need, I need those people to tell me that, yeah, because all entrepreneurs see is possibilities, of course. Uh, and so just on the question of scale, how, what, what, I, what is the formula that you go through as an engineer to evaluate whether it's going to be a company that can scale or not? What what's the thought process or what's the what's the analysis that you do to come out with a yes, this one's you know, this one's a full on yes, this one's a maybe and this one's a no? That's a very good question. <laughs> no, I actually I don't know. And actually I would turn the question around because I think you're very similar in that sense. How do you if you meet a company and you you can't spend thousands of dollars in, in, in actually due diligence thing. Do you, you got a good gut feeling and you got them recommended. How do you decide if you're going to say invest or let's follow them for another month or two? Well, one of the things I look for is, is how many cooks are there cooking? If, if, the, if the business model is so complicated that it depends on seven different different entities all lining up in exactly the right way to me that's a you know that's a big sign that you know we could be looking at conflicts of one kind that's uh, market fit for me yeah exactly so i'm i'm looking i look for that kind of a thing i so i'm looking for i'm looking for the model being simple i don't mean simplistic i mean simple meaning that it's executable in an elegant kind of way and if that seems and if i and i and i look at it you know how sometimes when you're in a dressing room you have mirrors where you can see yourself from every angle which sometimes isn't what you want to do but you can really see yourself from every angle i try and look at the business that way i look at it from this side and this side and this side and this side and if it 
meets that criteria, then I'm willing to give it to give it a try, as long as it, you know, as, uh, along with the other things. But that's part of my, that's part of how I look at that scaling question. Because I think it's much more likely to scale if there aren't a whole bunch of other people who can impede the, the possibility of that business growing at the end of the day. I also, I mean, for me, the questions, the, the, the problem that it's trying to solve is a huge problem. It has millions of people affected. So um, I also look at, at the country context and I, and I map various things on top of one another. I'm very interested in energy or water. So I will look at, you know, what is the electrification rate of the country? What is the, what is the number of people in addition to the electrification rate that don't have access to energy? So in a country like Afghanistan, it's 6% electrification rate, 28 million people who don't have access to energy. And then I look at a couple of other things that are kind of proxies for how money flows around. So I look at what the remittance rates are, what are the cross-border money flows, do people have disposable income, is there money floating around from other places, and I look at cell phone penetration. So Again, Afghanistan's interesting, you have a 56% cell phone penetration. So that tells me there's a really interesting market there for an idea, and there's the potential for it to scale just given those kinds of market conditions. So I do that kind of a, that kind of it's, you know, it's, again, it's a bit, it's a, it's, there's intuitive stuff going on, but it's not entirely irrational. And you and you can reuse, of course. I mean, what I mean is, is, since you have since you have a very narrow focus, you you know what I mean. You know what cap you need is like cell phone penetration. If if you moved into doing, uh, I mean, uh, um, I don't know, a carbon offsetting company or whatever. I mean, you, like, what are the things I'm going to ask for? I mean, how mo mobile phone penetration probably doesn't matter. I mean, so I think that is. Shall we um, perhaps op open? Yeah. yeah, for questions. Yeah. Any questions from the audience? Hello. Hi. I'm Bert from uh, Pim Wimmick in Amsterdam. I'm wondering, Hampus, you have uh, made three and a half impact investments, you just said. Um, I'm wondering what's different about those three and a half deals you've made and in what sense has um, the return on investment, the financial return on investment played a part in making those decisions? Uh, so, financial return investment. For me, I think that um, I, I, it's it's this it, this boils back to the be proud criteria for me. The the I, I think I don't I want to invest in companies that are economically sustainable, uh, and I think I, being sort of the be proud. I think the same thing as you want to be proud of your children. I want my children to impact the world one way or another. They have to figure out themselves how. And the second thing is I don't want to be I don't want my my children to call me when they need money. Uh, I'm happy to <laughs> to sort of help them, but I don't want only that dialogue. So I think for me, return investment the criteria for the for me there is they should get in an economically sustainable situation. Uh, I I talk to a lot of companies that have great ideas, but when you find out that this is like a donation driven idea, you're gonna come back in nine months, and either you want money from me or someone else, or you, you need your customers to donate, and it's never gonna work. So that is like the economical criteria for me, and the. First question, the first part of the question was the difference between the three and a half companies. The reason I call it three and a half is I one I would say impact, but I'm not sure it's the right kind of impact. I'm not sure uh, the three companies are uh, Desmo and Better Now, which are fairly similar companies. There are companies done for uh, developed countries that raises money from people who can actually give that money. In Desmo, work with retailers, um, and retailers should give some of their money and and in that whole chain. And what um, uh, better now do is they're a Kickstarter for charities. So I'm going to run a marathon, help me raise a million dollars. or That's a lot for me to run a marathon. But anyways, uh, uh, the, the half company is a call company called Ipit. And what Ipit do is that they're a, they're a food ambassador. They're a mobile application, mobile service that help you choose food um, depending on certain constraints. Because everybody have constraints. And uh, the reason they're a half is because how, how good an impact that is. And there are fields where it's very impact, like allergies and, and, and issues, but half of it, is, it feels very commercial. The, uh, the way they do, they do money is they create a, a direct dialogue between the food brands and the consumers, which is very valu valuable for both parties, actually. And the fourth company 
um, is a barista, which is a coffee shop, and a coffee shop that that, act, that part of their business idea is they they cut their own margins and and give that money um, uh, in in a lot of different ways. But the main way is every time you have a cup of coffee at barista, which is here in Malmo, um, they give food to uh, children in an African village so that they actually can go to school because they're their they can't their parents can't send them to school if they can't get food um so what barista have have given more than 300 i don't know what 300 and something now thousand um school lunches to children to make sure that these can go to school so barista was actually for me like impact and due diligence the hardest one cuz the two digital platforms I can sort of look at those and look at the technology and discuss what, what backend they should use. Barista, I don't know how to run a coffee shop. I have no clue. Everybody, everybody, I know everybody in this audience would one day start a coffee shop. So everybody went to a coffee shop, doing it sustainable. Well. How did you go about For me, it, I fell in love with the entrepreneur. Uh, I really liked Bjorn as an entrepreneur, and I really liked the, him and, and the, the, the team, and I just felt this should work. This, this ought to work. Um, so coming back to Bert's question, I mean, uh, like, let's fast forward. We meet together here again in three years' time. We'll ask you what impact did it, did these investments create, and and what were you looking for? What would you say? Yes, this was a success for me. I fell in love with the entrepreneur. The company grew. We did, you know, re reached thousands of people. W what do you look for? So that you s for yourself say, yeah, this was really a good impact investing I investment. Thi I think that right now I haven't reached the criteria. I I think I'm a bad impact investor and what I mean <laughs> by uh, an evil one because right now I think the impact I'm looking for is not probably the global impact that impact investors should look for. I'm looking for the very local uh, local impact in the entrepreneur. I I I've started I've started a business. I've helped a lot of entrepreneurs and I know the extreme pain of being an entrepreneur. And the reason I got into this is that I felt my god these are the people that everybody should be helping. I mean, everybody should spend 24-7 helping these people because they, they put themselves in so many awful situations for the rest of the planet. Not only impact invest, uh, investment, uh, in, impact entrepreneurs, any entrepreneurs. So I just felt I want to help these people. And so how do I evaluate if Barista was a good investment? That, that, that uh, Bjorn and Nina and Maria, the, the, the three, three founders, that they... Uh, call me up in in, uh, in three years and say, oh, I've met this cool company I'm looking to invest in. Do you want to co-invest? Uh, I'm thinking of doing this and that because they've made a lot of money of their investment, uh, and they did it in a in a in a good way. So I think that I I'm 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 not that good of an impact investor because the 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 main impact I want to do is the the entrepreneur. That's sort of that's how far I've reached now. I'm I'm s sad. I I actually think you're selling yourself short because I walked over here this morning and I walk right past one of those baristas and one of the things that it says is fair trade coffee. So there's a, there's a part of saving the world that's happening just in the use of the fair trade coffee that, that you haven't even mentioned. No, th th and that's part, to me, that's part of that package that made it attractive to me and I didn't even invest in them. The thing I love about <laughs> barista, if you take that as a case, the reason I actually, I mean, the, the thing that really made it very clear for me was that the good thing about impact investment companies is that if they, if there are two good cases, either they succeed and uh, they impact the world and the investors get a lot of money back, or they get copied by some evil other company that copy their 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 impact part, their good parts, and the company barista goes bust. The thing is, as Bjorn said the first time we met, if Starbucks would copy barista's model, Ethiopia would be fed. So there's a good part of losing. If you just inspire other people, that's sufficient. So one of the cool things I love about Barista is they started looking at plastic cards. Why are we having plastic cards? We have, I mean, loyalty cards. No, we want to do cards which, uh, which are made of, of wood, which don't use plastic, which are using, using corn as, as a, whatever it's called, uh, laminated by, by, by with corn and cornstarch and da-da-da-da-da. And they, they created this, they created this from scratch. I mean, sourced it and found out and, and sort of put it online. Now we've done this. And what happens is you have other organizations in Sweden calling up, hey, how do you do those cards? It's like, this is how we do it. I mean, copy them for God's sake. You're not even a coffee shop. So just please steal our cards. Um, so barista is good cradle to grave. We are, should we check to see if there are other questions? Actually, we're running out of time. Oh, oh. no. 
Talkative. <laughs> Thank you. So, H Hampus, we should talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Absolutely. Thanks very much. Thank you. <clears throat>